So again, also from my side, thanks to the organizers for inviting me here, and welcome to you all. And it's a pleasure to speak directly after Alex. I can assure you the environment at Duke is, in fact, fantastic, even though there are also other places which I think are very good. So we're sampling a bit of a bigger space recently. Okay, so in this particular workshop, you hear a lot, as just now, for instance, about positioning of nuclear zones, right? And uh, what are preferences for DNA binding proteins that might come up in the next talk, I have a hunch. Um, and then sort of all of this massive machinery works together, and at the end, there's like a tiny little thing happening at the end. It's not that important, actually, right? Just this little arrow here. And so what I thought I'd focus on is the reverse of this view, where essentially transcription is like this little unimportant thing upstream that happens occasionally. But what really determines the cellular fate and the states in the cell is actually what happens to the transcripts. So how does a particular gene get transcribed? How does it get processed? How is it exported? How stable is it? How efficient is the translation initiation? What's the rate of translation? Where is it localized? Uh, to which cellular compartment and so forth? These are all things that happen post-transcriptionally. And of course, now we have technology to assay essentially interactions of regulatory factors on RNA as we do on DNA. And also what's really exciting to profile not just steady state RNA, but actually these different states. So what is the nascent RNA? What is the nuclear versus cytoplasmic fraction? Um, what's the stability and the half-life of RNA and so forth? And so for all of these, we have assays available by now. And so I thought I'd focus on two topics that we've been working on in my group for a while now that are a bit complementary, so that allows you to see the parallels that we actually have between the transcriptional and the post-transcriptional world. So I'll give a little bit of an introduction overview of how you actually assay regulatory interactions on the RNA side. And then also what kind of type of exciting things we might be able to tell from these different RNA-seq assays when you move beyond steady state RNA. So these are essentially the two halves in my talk today. And um, I think we'll see some interesting parallels, especially also what algorithms we might have to design for these purposes, because both of these, as it turns out, use location-specific information. So it's going to be interesting to see if some of these uh, fast algorithms for um, expression quantification, for instance, that we heard about yesterday, still work here, because we are actually interested in reference locations, as you'll see. OK, so why would we bother with RNA binding proteins? Well, there might not be quite as many as transcription factors, but it's not too far off. These numbers keep rising. In fact, um, there's many unusual enzymes that people have seen recently being associated to RNA as well. Um, they come in a whole bunch of different classes. There's lots of RNA binding domains. That field is much less explored and understood than the domains for transcription factors. Um, we don't quite understand yet what all these things are doing because they might impact these very different levels. They might impact translation, but maybe if they're also present in the nucleus, they do something else there. So we often see that uh, RNA binding proteins have different roles. Lots of them are supposed to do some moonlighting in different places in the cell. And often they also contain one than more, bind, uh, more than one binding domain so that you could actually really interact with different target sets and sites and sequences um, at different times or different states in the cell. And so my group has been working sort of in parallel. We do still continue, and it's about half-half in the lab. And you can ask my students, Mahmoud and Henriette, who are there. They work on this side of the lab, where we actually deal with transcriptional control and um, how the enhancers find their target genes and how does chromatin change over time course data, all these exciting things. And then in parallel, we have these assays now that can look at the transcriptome. So we can do occupancy profiling that tells us where something is stuck to RNA, but not what it is. And we can also zoom in then with ever-increasing resolution to identify individual target sites for specific proteins. And the resolution here is actually really comparable to probably chip X or chip nexus on the uh, transcriptional side. And you'll see why that is. So how did people start to identify targets for these RNA binding proteins it was actually similar to chip. So you do an RNA immunoprecipitation instead of chromatin. And initially, this was done by hybridizing the target sequences that you pull out in your IP to arrays and to identify the target genes, but not necessarily the locations where they're bound. And then um, from um, Bob Darnell's lab, um, once sequencing came along, you could start to do RNA cross-linking and IP, and then followed by sequencing to get higher resolution. 
So what you use is essentially UV light to crosslink. You don't use a chemical. You can crosslink on RNA uh, with UV light. You can then essentially um, extract fragments where a particular protein was bound, attach your linkers, and sequence and amplify as you would do for CHIP. And you can already see indicated here, often through this cross-linking, something actually happens at the target site. We call this diagnostic events, and that helps us to narrow down where exactly in the genome, uh, in the transcriptome, <laughs> these um, factors might actually interact. And the specific protocol that induces a lot of these uh, diagnostic events is called PARCLIP, um, which is a modification where you cross-link actually with a different wavelength, and you also add, you pulse 4 u into the cells. And what happens is that 4 u is really amenable to being cross-linked at, at this particular wavelength. And so you get a higher enrichment, a higher signal to noise compared to regular clip. You see a better local enrichment of your reads here. Um, but what also happens is that the 4 u is actually misread when you do your reverse transsynthesis and library uh, construction. So what happens is that at locations, preferentially at locations where really a factor interacted with the RNA, we see T2C conversions in the actual sequences. And so this is what we utilized by now five years ago when we developed the first peak finder for this ParkLib data. And you can see sort of what happens here in this particular example. You have your regular read depth from this clip library here in gray. And now what we can do is we can actually look for an excess, a local excess of these T2C mutations in your sequence to additionally guide us where the interaction happened other than just read coverage from the library. And so this gives us this much higher resolution. You can see here, right, you have these gray read clusters here, and they kind of also flow together because as it happens, you have two target sites for PAM2 here in this particular target sequence that are pretty close to each other. But these diagnostic mutations, so the signal in this case is the relative fraction of T2C conversions smoothed over a local window. So we have a pargin smoother here. And you see that this T2C conversion exceeds essentially the background, which is the relative T density in the sequence without mutations, just how rich is your T. Uh, so what's the prior in a way to have any kind of event to being seen at this location. And you can see here that you, with very high accuracy, with almost new single nucleotide resolution for some proteins, it depends on how well they cross-link, you're able to actually identify the target sites. Yeah? So this paralyzer approach turned out to be pretty useful because what it does is implicitly actually um, cancel out any kind of library bias or sequencing depth or different expression levels because we only look for this T2C um, excess mutation relative to the T density in the reads that have Ts in them at that location. So I don't need to explicitly actually model, for instance, the variability of RNA-C coverage or something here. How about uh, CPG island and when you don't have enough teeth? Well, as it so happens, CPG islands are not so much in RNA, right? So they are more in the genome. Actually, the, luckily for us, especially the untranslated regions where many of these proteins like to bind are AU rich. So there is, of course, this potential problem. And this is why people have developed, and as we'll see, this is something that we deal with now, a different CLIP protocol. So you can still do regular HITS CLIP, as it's called, now CLIP-seq, um, where you don't induce this type of mutation, where you don't need to pulse with 4th IU and you're not dependent on the T. You can um, use uh, modified guanin as well, but the cross-linking isn't quite as good for that. There ways around it, essentially, at least uh, in terms of protocols and using different protocols. So, just to wrap up, what we can do with this type of approach in this first part is that, um, of course, there's a large interest also now in more, um, for instance, in congenital disorders to understand how RNA regulation plays a role there. And one particular study that we were involved here, this was a collaboration with Tom Tuschel, was to figure out what the FMR1 protein, so the fragile X mental retardation-related gene, actually binds to and what its targets are and what the specificities are. And to this end, we had essentially, so fragile X syndrome is usually caught, uh, caused by a triplet expansion in the promoter. Um, so this is not what we're looking at here, of course. You can get the syndrome also by mutations in the binding domains. And so we essentially profiled um, the wild type FMR1 gene. It has different isoforms, so we needed to profile the different isoforms, as well as 
uh, the variant with the patient mutation and see what happens. And so in this case, um, the fMR1 gene actually has, as you can see, three binding domains of two different uh, motif classes to actually interact and find target sites. And so what we noticed essentially is after we identified sites here um, that you had two different classes of sites uh, with two different types of sequence motifs that are again here at the locations where the T2C conversion exceeds the background. Again, with very high resolution and essentially that allowed us to do motif finding. When we did motif finding, we essentially found two different uh, sequence motifs um, that were present. And now we could actually compare the patient mutation, which happens in this KH domain here, to the wild type and see which type of motifs do we preferentially lose. And in this way, even be able to not just find the target motifs, but also assign the motifs to the particular domain that was actually binding to this particular sequence preference. So what you see is if you actually look then at the mutation uh, versus the wild type, where it likes to bind, you see that in this ACUK target motif, you have a much bigger decrease essentially in binding than uh, for target sites that contain this other motif. Yeah? And so from there on, we could then, of course, find pathways and see what the target genes are enriched and so forth. But this is the type of resolution and data that you actually get out on the RNA side. So I think that's a pretty exciting um, venue to be in. So, what? yeah. Was there any change in preferential secondary structure in this example? So we didn't look at this. So all of this, this is a different question that we'll get to here now. Of course, RNA binding proteins, um, a lot of them have primary sequence preferences. But these primary sequence preferences, if nothing else, will occur in a secondary structure context. The RNA can fold up, and we might actually have additional information from the secondary structure around the primary sequence preferences. Does the sequence occur in a loop, in a bulge, in an unstructured region, and so forth? Um, the problem is that there's, of course, very little ground truth to it. So what we recently um, switched to is to start simulating libraries to be able to see how well we could actually identify clusters. And then in those simulated libraries, we could embed motifs or different secondary structural features to see how much that actually helps us. Secondary structure prediction is really notoriously difficult, right? We are talking about the whole transcript. We can't fold the whole transcript to the minimum free energy and think that this makes any sense. Even looking at posterior probabilities of just being paired and unpaired, even that signal vanishes once you go to 200 nucleotides or so. So you really can only look at the very small local context with purely prediction methods so far. Um, so what we've done, this was published at PSB just now, is to simulate essentially, starting from something like the flux simulator, to get uh, fragments and transcript abundances at first, and then fragments from these transcripts, we can now essentially say, oh, what would an R a particular RNA binding protein, a known one or a one that we make up, actually like to bind to? Then essentially figure out what would the library construction, which fragments would it leave? How would it amplify? What amplification biases would we get? What other raw reads? What, of the, what type of diagnostic events would we be able to put in there? And then actually have at least simulated benchmark data that allows us also to evaluate different CLIP protocols. So ParClip induces these T2C conversions. Um, regular hits clip has more of a deletion of single nucleotides. There's a protocol called iClip that truncates when it hits the, um, essentially where the protein is binding, so it digests down really the fragments to exactly where the protein bound. And so all of these different things we can actually include in our prediction, right? We don't need to not just do these T2C conversions. So we switched um, to different models now um, where we essentially replace this previous approach, this paralyzer, completely with the hierarchical probabilistic model. The closest that's been done in this direction is actually by Nico. So if you have questions about models like this, you can also ask him. <laughs> and the basic idea here now is that we have a, a, a multinomial distribution of these diagnostic events and that these diagnostic events are correlated if we are actually at a true binding site, if we have replicates. So essentially we're moving now to the scheme of the type of data that, for instance, ENCODE produces, where you have multiple replicates, where you have a control input type 
a background sequenced library and so forth. So these were all things that five years ago we just didn't have available. And so this parallelizer, very simple heuristic of looking for an excess of T2C conversions went a long way. But now we actually have different type of data that we need to consider and that allows us to really um, use a different strategy to identify these sites. So that's work in progress. We can essentially now um, we have a hierarchical model where we start with the Dirichlet multinomial and then the actual reads of different types of diagnostic events. If you have good replicates, you can even learn what type of diagnostic events are present from the data from scratch. Um, you can account then for, um, or you need to account, in fact, in this case now, of course, for RNA sequencing depth and expression level for the gene that we had previously implicit in our approach. And we need to link these individual sites and whether there are mutations at a specific site in a larger context because these sites occur not just one at one time, but they occur clustered in the genome. And of course, you also want to extend your cluster call to the size of the read length for the very least, right? These mutations are somewhere in the read. If you just um, call individual locations where you find them, you don't find the whole binding site. And so you need to come up with post-processing tricks and so forth. And so here we decided we put that straight into the model where we have coverage of the sequence reads, these diagnostic mutations, and a local dependency structure and a hidden Markov model actually glued together. And so I can't show you real results there yet. We are starting to do better. It was actually took us a long time to beat our own old tool, uh, which has come a long way. But especially with these type of simulated libraries, we can now actually find out, okay, where is actually improvement really coming from? Would replicates really help? Would I need to sequence deeper and so forth? We can actually simulate that and get ideas also how to design experiments. Okay, so that was the first part. I saw there were some hands in between, I think, out of the corner of my eyes. Yeah. So, so you showed this profile from the, from the experiment. So, and I wonder how it matches kind of evolutionary conservation of this motif in the... So you can also, of course, use, I mean, you can use additional features, for instance, to then do motif prediction or something based on these side calls. Yeah, yeah so how, how, how important, yeah, essentially, yeah. And, um, it is usually, as you could see in this one example for FMR1, they have a four nucleotide sequence motif. It's really very short, so the local context will definitely play a role. And so if you do motif finding, people have started looking into this. You can use uh, conservation or secondary structure features and so forth to actually then try to figure out what are actually the preferences in the first place that guide the proteins to that place. But you mean finding motif in the, in the, in the experimental data? I yep. was Thinking sort of using kind of similar regions in other organisms. <coughs> yeah. And see, see whether you can just look at the conservation kind of. Um, that wouldn't really help you. There's an overall conservation bias towards the beginning and end of the UTR, for instance, likely because that is where enzymes, you know, hey, for, for cleavage and polyadenylation, for instance, bind and so forth. So it's, it's really tricky to do this just by conservation, actually. And there's what we think, there's a lot of turnover of these sites. We typically see that you have actually, uh, some genes even have 20 or 30 target peaks in them. And so this is actually the next step now where we're at to try to understand are each of these sites individually important or do you just want to make sure to reach a certain level of, of attracting proteins to bind there, but each individual site like in a transcription factor and in a cluster of transcription factor binding sites that each site might not be important. These are just questions we can now start to address. I would like to go on actually so that I get to my second part. I'm sorry guys. <laughs> I have one a very quick question. A very quick question. Uh oh, that's how they all start. <laughs> so what does the binding then predict you? So let's say you know everywhere where your RNA binds mm -hmm. binds to the transcriptome. What yeah. Well, that's the perfect segue, in fact, to my second part. Oh. Yay! <laughs> no, um, of course, we, um, what you need to complement this binding information is to look at, for instance, knockdown data like we did for FMR1, where you had point mutations or knockdowns of the factors, and then actually see what happens now in the cell, right? And so does this particular protein, is it important for processing of the transcript or stability or translation and so forth? And so for translation in particular, there's been a really cool essay that I think everybody should really become more aware of because it has, 
I think, a high potential to definitely complement, if not replace, regular RNA-seq for many applications. So I think you should probably be aware of that and also think about there is no single cell data on this just yet, but hopefully at some point there will be, so maybe then other people here will get even more excited. So the essay that I mean is called Ribosome Profiling or RiboSeq. It was actually developed by Nick Angoli and Jonathan Weissman's lab. They're here at Berkeley and UCSF. And the idea is the following, that we might get a, a, a snapshot of what actually gets translated and determine what transcripts might make it into proteins from sequencing, so not by mass spec. So effectively, you, uh, again, stall, in this case, uh, with a cyclohexamide, typically, ribosomes on the RNA, you digest the overhanging fragments so that you have, hopefully, um, mono, monosomes, monoribosomes, not nucleosomes, right? Um, and then actually sequence what was bound uh, and protected, essentially, by these ribosomes. With the idea of something is actively translating, you'll, of course, get many reads from these libraries um, when you try to purify the ribosome-bound fragments. And so this could have very high uh, resolution because these sequence reads can map anywhere along a transcript. And you can, in fact, sort of see what happens here a little bit. If this is the start codon and here is a stop codon, you see that these read start positions then are offset um, from the actual codon that gets translated because the ribosome covers a larger fragment. And so if I um, look at um, annotated coding genes as a benchmark, I, typ I can typically figure out the offset and actually really see which codon actually this particular ribosome was translating at that position. Yeah? And so people started to try to use this data ever, of course, since the pro uh, protocol was published about seven years ago. Um, and the first sort of metrics were just essentially just looked at the global characteristics of these, um, of these libraries. So, for instance, is there an enrichment over RNA-seq, right? So excess relative enrichment for specific transcripts compared to others would tell you they're translated highly. Um, the next thing was a ribosome release score, where you a bit more precisely look at enrichments of um, or depletion of 3' UTR over CDS reads, right? Because as you leave um, the coding sequence, there shouldn't be any scanning ribosomes anymore. Of course, the ribosome will scan, so you see some reads up here, but you shouldn't really see any reads after you have encountered the stop codon. So you can use that as a metric. And then people started, as we'll see, to become a bit more um, specific for this protocol and actually saying, well, maybe we can see in-frame reads, actually, right? The ribosome moves three nucleotides at a time, so we should be able to find an excess, for instance, with a kind of chi-square test statistic for having an excess of reads in one frame over the two other frames. And that should give us a much better indication if ribosomes were really moving in steps of three through the sequence. And in particular, just two years ago, a year and a half ago, actually, there were two papers that now figured out that if you get your library conditions just right and you look at specific fragment lengths, in this case, typically it's 29 nucleotides for, for animal genomes, you see this really, really striking bias. So this is a metaplot, again, uh, um, upstream of the start codon. You, you really see that you um, get this three prime periodicity as a very strong signal in your data. Not 10.3 nucleotides, this time it's three. And you can see that this is not quite as pronounced if you use slightly different read lengths because the, nucle uh, nucle the ribosome covers exactly 29 nucleotides if it is engaged, fully assembled ATS and was active and scanning, or tra actively translating, actually. Why is the read length? The read length is just what happens no. No, no, no. I mean, you digest away all the overhanging fragments, and you try to you try to f purify the exact um, footprint of the ribosome, right? And so, in our library, that we then sequenced and said, well, we need to see the data wasn't published at the time when we heard about these studies. Let's just do this ourselves and actually see what we get. And you sort of see about 70 or 80 percent of enrichment for the actual frame that's used and about 10 percent of background for each of the other two frames. This is, again, starts uh, and stop code on aligned. So that led us to think about, well, maybe we can do better than just a simple chi-square test for read uh, for a frame preference because um, you might just by chance, by amplification bias and other things, get an excess of reads in just one frame. 
without seeing a consistent three periodic signal throughout your whole coding sequence. So how can we look at that? Well, Fourier transform came to mind. And you can see what happens here if you take a fairly, a really good example case, 300 nucleotide exon. Hey, we have, in this case, even 90% of frame bias. And you see that if you do a discrete Fourier transform, you get a, a peak at 0.33 at a one third hertz frequency. Yeah? So if you now go to a presumably non-coding region um, with less coverage, so there's a link RNA exon here, you might still see a frame bias, and a chi-square test will tell you, oh, you see a your preferential three-periodic bias here. Let's call this coding. But if you actually look at the, at the spectrogram, there is no 0.33 periodicity here. Yeah? So this statistic can really be fooled just by you know, a few positions where you have, just by chance, more reads than in other positions, and they just so happen to be modulo 3 in distance from each other. The problem is that the, typically the Fourier transform will still get you the regular or run of the mill Fourier transform will be too noisy because of course you have few reads in many cases and you want to have a, a stable estimator for your frequencies. And it so turns out that uh, this was actually perfectly developed. They are theoretically optimal filter banks that allow you to minimize the bias and the variance of your estimators of the spectrogram. So this has been developed in the 80s by Thompson. Um, there's a really nice review for, if you're interested in this from just a couple of years ago. And they essentially, the, the theory tells you that there is a filter bank that you can run your original sequence through and then average the spectrograms that you get on the other end to actually amplify or get an unbiased estimator as well as you can under certain, of course, noise assumptions and so forth. What that does in practice, you see here, we, here we have that same coding axon, and here you actually now see what this amplified, cleaned up, um, multi-tapered, as it's called, uh, spectrogram looks like. You have really a much, much better cleaner signal to noise picture here than in the original Fourier transform. Yeah? And you can do statistical tests on this and actually say, okay, with what particular you know, cutoff of 0.05 p-value was there a significant uh, three-periodic frequency detected in my signal? And I don't, have, um, I don't need to correct for multiple hypotheses here because I'm just testing for this particular um, frequency, right? Yeah. Do we know, don't we just know the reading frame from the sequence? Because we know the genetic code. I mean, why, why do you need to know this? All? I mean, I'm a bit lost. <laughs> Eric, always ask the questions before your slides come. You're thinking, Ted, you're supposed to be asleep, right? Why are you awake here? <laughs> come on. <laughs> we'll get there. I think you'll, you'll see why, what we can actually do with this now. OK? Can I, can I ask something? Mm -hmm. So how long does the exon need to be in order for you to have some signal? Oh, OK. okay. <laughs> Okay, let's just look at this. We effectively thought, okay, let's just try this in our library. This is actually pretty low coverage. You had, I think, about 15 million of these 29 nucleotide long reads left in the end because you throw away a lot of your actual sequences. And so here you see how many from all exons in the genome, annotated exons, if we bin them by length or by just three expression terciles, um, how much do we actually call that you would see as RNA-seq being minimally expressed. So you have some RNA-seq evidence, a few reads that this gene might be expressed, how many of the exons for different length and coverage uh, or expression do we get. And you can see that um, even at low expression rates and really short like sequences, you would be able to call quite a lot. And once you go to medium expression levels or reasonably normal exon-sized length, you're actually getting the, uh, a signal for the majority of the exons. So this is on a single exon level. Of course, now you, uh, a gene will have multiple exons, so your signal is actually typically stronger than that. But to come to Eric's question, there's been a lot of debate in the literature about micro peptides. So essentially, whether the genome, in fact, might encode, um, so for some conspiracy theorists, thousands of micro peptides that evaded our annotation so far because they're too short. Because annotating from the, from the sequence bias works in a single genome if you have a few hundred nucleotides. It works with conservation if you have, you know, 100 nucleotides. But typically around 100 amino acids, actually, is the cutoff where people annotated 
proteins in the genome annotation pipelines. So anything smaller than 100 amino acids is called a micropeptide. And now we even have a dwarf, so dwarf ORFs that are like 20 nucleotides long or something like that. And so we wanted to see, can we push it? Would we be able in vivo now see whether such small ORFs that are present everywhere in the genome, are they actually used? And it's also interesting in the context of link RNAs because people use these early RiboSeq libraries to essentially come to the exact opposite conclusions. There are papers uh, that say, oh, there's, it's clear evidence that link RNAs are not translated, and there are other papers that came out back to back on the same data and say, hey, they're all translated. There are no non-coding genes, everything gets translated. Right? And so we thought with this approach, you might have a road in to actually see whether that works. Um, let me just show you here a few examples again, a bit more unbiased, not best case, worst case, but here we have three exon slash genes that are exactly of the same length and they have the same number of reads aligning to them. And so here you can see that you have a coding exon, here you have something in the 5' UTR, here's something in the link RNA, and again here are these multi-tapered periodograms and you see again that the coding sequence is the only one that gives you this clear peak. Okay. Um, you can also see that we can tell likely alternative start codons apart from each other, at least if they are reasonably spaced from each other. So that's, for instance, one thing that, again, we can't just do from the sequence, but we can in vivo see which ones are actually translated by looking at, you know, alternative, by walking back from a stop codon and walking back to different ATG candidates and seeing what the coverage and the periodicity is. And so, of course, here, this is pretty short, so you just about get a significant peak here, you go to the next one, ah, now your peak is very clear at the one-third uh, frequency. If you extend further, there's very little coverage there, it's not really pre frame preferential, and you see that actually the, um, the signal also drops again. So with a few simple heuristics, we can actually extend and determine the, the particular start codon that's used. And so here's now where we detect translation unbiased in every annotated thing in the genome, be it antisense, process, transcript, or whatever ENCODE uses as categories. And so we find in this particular cell type 11,500 coding genes as being translated. We also find other fragments, so we find, of course, upstream open reading frames now as well. So in our case, these are separate uh, frames that are separated from the main uh, coding sequence and are in the 5' prime UTR. And so this has been a proposed regulatory mechanism that should impact on the translation of the actual coding sequence. But again, of course, half of the transcripts have a potential UORF in them that, you know, a start and stop codon in frame isn't too hard to get. Um, but we can tell now which hundreds of genes might actually make use of this regulatory mechanism. And we can also look at more exotic parts in the genome and, for instance, yes, find periodic spectra um, in, for instance, link RNAs, a few dozen genes, or in pseudogenes that are actually translated and the evidence comes from uniquely aligning reads just to the pseudogene, not to the original gene. So um, this is also an interesting observation. You might still have translation of these pseudogenes. Um, let me just go briefly towards the end here. Um, so we then wanted to see, is there any real evidence that even these, you know, 80 link RNAs or these 100 process transcripts might actually really encode for something? So we look at conservation. You can see what that typically looks like for protein coding gene along the start and stop codon. You see, again, three prime periodicity. For the UORs, for instance, interestingly, you see a conservation at the start codon and the stop codon, but not of the actual sequence. You know, underlining, yes, there's some functional, something functional conserved here that might distract the ribosomes from the real coding sequence, but itself it's likely not producing a peptide because there's no selection on the amino acid itself. And then again on the link RNAs, um, this is almost flat, so even the ones that we detect, we see just a little bit of hump again at the, at the start codon, but there's no three periodicity anymore in the conservation and the sequence. And so here now for pseudogenes, you see that that uh, conservation is getting eroded, right, because these are decaying genes. Okay. Um, and the last thing that I want to point out, we can now go to mass spec data also and see could this actually replace mass spec altogether. So coming to this idea that I mentioned that this assay might actually really complement as a routine thing regular RNA-seq because in this assay you find what's actually coding. And so we essentially designed... Um, 
a mass spec library, a query library, just from the coding sequences that we annotated from our one data set, and then compared it against all of Uniprot to look in deep mass spec data for that same cell type. And you can see that we pretty much identify exactly the same things that are identified by Uniprot. There's a few things that we find extra and that have reasonable expression levels. The things that are called by Uniprot extra are so low in the RNA-seq steady state level that these might even be false calls to begin with, right? You have always a false discovery rate associated with these calls. So we can identify spec, um, essentially, the translated proteins as well as if I had Uniprot and a deep mass spec data set just from this one library, right? And then we could also see now what do we find? Can we confirm some of these new peptides? And here again, yeah, we do find three peptides in two uh, unique link RNAs, but nothing of these 79 or something that had these periodic um, reads in them. And that again now is of course then the question of what do these things actually do? Is there a function um, for, for instance, these link RNA ORFs that we detect that are maybe more related to U ORFs or that protect somehow the RNAs from degradation? but now it might actually have any role in producing a stable peptide because we don't detect them in mass spec. Okay, so with that, I would like to finish up and thank the people in the lab who did that work. So the first part is essentially an RNA binding proteins is a postdoc that's been in the lab for a few years, Neil Mukherjee. Um, and the second part essentially is then, well, Philip Javis uh, developing that new P-caller algorithm and then Antje and Lorenzo did the experimental and the computational work on this um, riboseq analysis on the ribotaper. It was published last month, so you can read all about it elsewhere. Thank you. So I have a question on the second part. So mm -hmm. Um, in your opinion, how, how much quantitative is this profiling? Like, can you do like alternative translation, like we do at the uh, uh, differential discussion? Like, uh, so the regular, yeah. So the regular uh, mass spec data gives you these IBAC values that are somewhat proportional to the protein abundance, and our Fourier coefficient is slightly better in the correlation than the regular RNA seq coverage would be. And of course, it looks at something quite different. It's of course dependent a bit on the coverage, how strong your signal is, but it really looks at this periodicity. So we're developing essentially now a pretty simple linear model to combine the regular RNA-seq evidence and the superiodic evidence to see how far we can actually get in predicting translation rates. And for that, of course, the real data to use is uh, SILAC, like pulse labeling essentially of proteomics data that um, also tells you about the translation rates because the corresponding thing to these ribosome covered fragments would really be the translation rate and not the overall abundance because we don't know about the stability of the proteins. Yeah. For the first part of your talk, mm -hmm. so uh, KH domains they usually come uh, in a multi domain fashion. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, uh, can you really distinguish which of the footprint belongs to which of the domains? Because they don't always necessarily find exactly the same sequence. Yeah, so we haven't tried to really resolve it to that point. So you could see, like anecdotally in this plot that I showed, you could even see that there were two peaks very close to each other that might essentially pair with these two KH domains. But the data is still very noisy. There's a lot of things, that's why I meant, that's why we're developing this new approach now as well. There's essentially um, a lot of peaks that are shared between the different RNA binding proteins. Now that we have libraries, many libraries for different proteins, there's a strong sequence bias of the uh, enzyme that digests essentially the fragments that go into your library sequencing, so that could create spurious peaks just based on that. And also, um, it's likely that you sim have something similar maybe to hot spots on the hot regions on the DNA, where maybe just because the sequence is open in an open conformation, everything sticks a little bit. And you must remember that, of course, RNA comes in many, many copies. It's not just two alleles here. So, of course, you can see a mixture. You could actually really see a mixture of the same location in different mRNA copies being occupied by different factors. 
But of course, that I wouldn't really expect that that has the same phenotypic impact than one that's really covered always by the same factor very specifically. And so these are kind of the things that we do now in terms of the modeling to try to account for these biases and do an integrated analysis and get a bit better headway in which of these many sites that we find are functional. And then to come back to the question, hopefully then for those subsets, for instance, we can also figure out some of the more subtle arrangements. Right, let's thank you over once more. Thank you.